Welcome to the Business and People Podcast. I am your host, Walt Bayless, and on today's show, we speak to New York Times best-selling author, world speaker, and futurist, Mr. Joel Com. This is a really entertaining episode and one for anyone that's wondering what's next in your life. I love the direction in the interview we take when we're asking about where should people focus and what should they do if they find themselves in that position of asking what's next and where am I going. Joel's ver- uh, vision as a futurist really allows him to to take that question and um, internalize it. And I love what he talks about. I hope you do too. Joel's written 15 books. We talk a little bit about his new book, which is called The Fun Formula. We talk about his podcast, which has reached over 7 million people. And we talk a lot about what each and uh, every one of us can be doing to achieve real happiness in our lives. I love this episode. I hope you do too. Please enjoy on the Business and People podcast, this interview with Mr. Joel Com. Joel Com, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Walt. It's good to see you. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks. Um, Joel, as we mentioned in the introduction a few minutes ago, you wear, you wear a lot of hats. I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated. Congratulations on the launch of the new book, by the way. Um, that looks like a uh, not only a great read for people, but it, w- it looks like it was fun to put together. Yeah, well, I mean, it's called The Fun Formula, and it's yeah. my 15th book, and it's really the one that's closest to my core out of all the books I've written, because I was able to reverse engineer my failures and my successes and distill it down to a non-mathematical formula that I think is pretty universal. I love it. It was I was reading the, uh, the short um, script about it, Small Tweaks, to, to daily operations can inject a, you know, a lot more fun. What brought you to that book? I mean, as you said, 15 books. What brought you to the fun formula? Uh, my life, yeah. right? It's, it's really, it's a matter of um, reverse engineering what I've done, what's worked, what hasn't. And, you know, there's this mentality out there today about the hustle and grind being the way to success. And that's just, that's never been me. And what I discovered is when I was doing this hustle and grind thing, it's actually when I had the least success, the greatest success came when I was pursuing my own curiosity, taking risks and, and trusting the process. And uh, overwhelmingly, you know, not, not just by a little, by a lot, and so I think the hustle and grind uh, is a den- dangerous mentality that actually leads to burnout and relationship problems and, and not the type of financial or business success that most people long for. So how would you say that um, uh, somebody who ha- has been in that hustle and grind, I mean, we, we hear the, the Grand Candones, the 10X and the, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. And, and that's been a long admired uh, stanza from an entrepreneur's perspective. How would you suggest someone go from that to moving towards a, a more fun and fulfilled day in well, the life? When you say admired, I've never admired it. And it's never the way I've chosen to live my life because money is in material goods are simply not the most important things in life. You know, pursuing wealth, and yeah. I mean, you know, mega wealth. Uh, it is not virtuous in and of itself. Adding massive value that leads to wealth is. And so, you know, if people want to follow Grant and 10X their lives, that's fine. I, I think that uh, people are going to be a lot more fulfilled if they're following their own passions and, and curiosity. And, yeah. uh, and as entrepreneurs taking risks and, you know, looking through doors when they appear to have a crack open, you know, or, or wide open rather than being single minded focus on, on one thing and uh, just burning the candle at both ends. It's never been the way that I've worked and that's never worked for me. I'm not saying that it can't, I'm just saying that that lifestyle isn't sustainable. Yeah, sure, sure. I've I've seen you uh, talk a few times on stage and and laughed myself stupid in the audience because I was so entertained. It looks like, uh, as you mentioned, you live that fun formula life. It looks like you, you just have a great time with what you're doing. I I do. I mean, it's not all fun and games, but I don't do what I don't want to do. There's always opportunities to make money. You know, we live in a world where there's more economic opportunity than ever before, you know, in the history of of mankind. And I, I'm solicited with opportunities. Oh, you can make a lot doing this. And I'm like, if it doesn't interest me, if I can't put my heart behind it, then why? for for a few bucks you yeah. know i've made a lot of money i've lost a lot of money i know how to make money and money is just not the key 
to happiness and to joy. I've distilled it down to two things that are the key, and that is the people in your life and the experiences that you have. And yeah. you don't need a lot of money to have either one of those. So I'm way more content not having a lot of money right now and not needing to build that kingdom to have a lot. Because at the end of the day, you got to ask yourself, well, for what? You know, yeah. with Gary Vaynerchuk, it's because he wants to own the New York Jets and you yeah. need a lot of money to own the New York Jets. So he has a why. And yeah. for him, that is his fun formula. So, you know, it's not mathematical. You have to plug it into to who you are, but it's all about being true to yourself and discovering that that's where you'll find your greatest success. Beautiful. I absolutely love it, man. I love it. So one of the things that, uh, that adorns your, uh, your resume these days is that you are a futurist and uh, you regularly talk on stage about that. How, first of all, how does one become a futurist and what does that actually mean for you in the day of the life of Joel Kong? That's a great question. I think there's two types of futurists. There are the philosophical futurists, and they're the ones that tell you, uh, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years down the road, this is what humanity will look like. And then there's the practical futurist, or as I like to call myself, a functional futurist. And that is, I'm always playing with the toys that I see as the next thing before the masses. Nice. So I can kind of tell you, this is going to be big. This is, you know, the way the ship is heading here. And you should be paying attention to this as a marketer, as a business person, as an entrepreneur, as a human being living in our civilization, whatever the case may be. So I don't just see the future. I tend to get there before the masses because I'm either pioneering some technology or acting as an early adopter in something that I believe is going to be impactful. Fantastic. And what are you, what are you playing with? What are you uh, toying around with at the moment that's, that's caught your eye? Well, cryptocurrency. Yeah. Uh, I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole a little more than two years ago, about two and a half years ago. And I've been fascinated with, and once I understood cryptocurrency and blockchain, uh, I can clearly see that this is where we're going. There's no question about it. And mass adoption will be coming. And there will be, every industry is going to be disrupted by blockchain technology. I knew this once I understood it, and I started a podcast with Travis Wright called The Bad Crypto Podcast. We're now more than two years in, 360 some odd episodes, over 7 million downloads. And uh, we're- Congratulations, by the way, that's, that's a fantastic. Thank you. Do, do you think, um, so I, I was reading about the, the Bad Crypto Podcast, over 400,000 downloads per month. It feels like that crypto movement, um, I, I wouldn't say it's mainstream, but I would say that it's got a lot of momentum. Yeah, no, we're, no, we're not at mainstream yet. Mainstream will come once the tools that are being developed have mainstream adoption. Um, a lot of people knowing that blockchain and Bitcoin exist and just investing it doesn't make it mainstream. So we're still in the early adopter phase. Um, you know, I would kind of liken it to where we were with the internet and the World Wide Web around 1997. Yeah, right. right. Still, still really early, maybe 98. Um, the, the big splash is yet to come. And, you know, once you're able to um, use Bitcoin the way that you use your Visa or MasterCard is when we're talking mainstream adoption. And that will happen. Uh, I have very little doubt about it. I'm not a financial analyst or advisor, but uh, this is what I'm banking on. And there's I, a lot of money uh, being poured in that direction. You can imagine that it's uh, it's starting to move that way. You know, the market cap for all the cryptocurrencies is around 300 billion right now, which is still just a tiny drop in the bucket. Yeah, it, it's it's you know, I mean, the stock market is like what 80 trillion or something ridiculous. But I don't know bit, the exact numbers, but I bit know that left there. <laughs> cryptocurrency is it's a very small. Part, and very few people actually own Bitcoin and there's only 21 million of them ever. So, you know, in the future, assuming Bitcoin does become a, uh, a currency that, you know, it's a reserve currency, um, people will be wealthy if they have, you know, a tenth of a Bitcoin. Right. Absolutely. Do you think, um, so as we record this, Facebook's just announced its own, uh, I guess, foray into the Bitcoin or into the crypto world. Let's make sure this right. What do you think? Uh, what do you think impact that will have in, in the blockchain and in crypto world? Well, the first thing is, uh, while I I don't like Facebook 
And I think that Mark Zuckerberg is evil. And I think that social media has done more to harm culture than to help. While there's certainly cases of, you know, people being helped by social media, I think it's been detrimental overall. Uh, you know, Facebook now, now that they have all our information, they want to become a world bank mm -hmm. and that should scare anybody. The good side of it is it's bringing awareness to yeah. cryptocurrency. So I, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, politics around that at the moment, as you said, if you're, if you're listening to this in the future, uh, you'll be able to catch up with Joel, of course, but, um, you know, we may, we may be proven wrong, but there's a lot of political storm about, um, the world's wealth being privatized and that kind of stuff. But, um, from a, uh, from an awareness point of view, have you seen other cryptocurrencies, uh, bounce as a result of Facebook's announcement? Uh, well, especially Bitcoin, you know, took off more. Some of them have bounced. Some of them are, are languishing. You know, there's yep. a lot of cryptocurrencies out there and we've been in development phase for a number of them and there's going to be competition just like once the web blew up websites began competing and, and those that were quality or had excellent marketing rose to the top and others you know went out of business and we're going to see the same thing happen with crypto and, and the market is going to decide it's a, it's a fascinating topic. I'm, I'm going to leave uh, people to come and, and get onto you with the Bad Crypto Podcast because I think that's a, a great resource if people want to, um, to find out more and certainly follow along with someone who's on the cutting edge of it. But taking that, taking that futurist view and looking a little bit forward, Joel, if you had an opportunity uh, to stand on a stage in front of graduate students right now, what message would you be giving that room full of kids who, you know, about their next steps into the world? Well, first of all, I'd probably tell them you just wasted a lot of money sure. unless they, unless they're going to become, um, you know, a professional, like an attorney, a doctor, you know, nuclear physicist, there's a lot degrees are needed in order to work in these areas. But for people getting liberal arts degrees, your sociology <laughs> degree, your women's studies degree, you know, uh, unless you're going into a profession that requires a degree, you're going to be paying off the student loans for quite some time. I would tell them, regardless of what you went to school for, don't get stuck in that being the one thing that you do. Because I just this case after case of people that are then stuck in a career and they buy into, you know, what the world sells them on having the house and, you know, with the mortgage and the cars and, and all this and not experiencing freedom and instead being burdened with financial responsibility that they didn't see coming. And so whatever you're going to do, make sure you're following your heart and do what you love. Do what, what makes you come alive. Do what's fun for you and where you can bring the most value to others. And that's where ultimately I believe you're going to have the greatest success. I love it. I, I think that's a, a great message. Um, what would you, have, if you had the opportunity to speak to yourself in that position? So, I talk to myself all the time. What are you talking about? I, <laughs> <laughs> it's when you answer yourself. That's when we have a real problem. Oh, I do that too. It's very worrisome. But, you know, once you get a little and therapeutic, older, like, you know what? I'm, I'm bored. I'm going to have a conversation. That's, that's how if the I podcast actually my started. Former self. Nice. Um, you well, mean, I would say you mean young Joel Com. you go back. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I would say you're enough nice. as you are. I would say don't do drugs. Um, and I would say don't chase the dollar. Let it chase you. Awesome. Awesome. I love the, uh, the you're enough. It's an interesting one to have that as the, the first thing that, that came from you um, to look your younger self in the eye and say you're enough. I think a lot of people struggle with that, Joel, uh, in terms of um, defining themselves by what they do and, uh, you know, struggling with that self-worth and that ability to contribute. Um, yeah, you're not a human. You're not a human doing. You're a human being. And learn to be, learn to accept who you are. It doesn't mean lean into your flaws, embrace them and, you know, uh, magnify them. It means recognize those and, and change those things that you can change and accept the things that, that you can't. And not only in yourself and other people, right? I mean, we're, when we're in our 20s and we think that, you know, the world is our oyster and it is, and we can do anything. And yes, we can, but there are harsh realities uh, in this world and roadblocks and obstacles come up all the time and you have to be able to pivot in those and accept, 
oh, it's time to do something else or try something new. And I can't tell you how many times in my career, you know, I'm in my 25th year of business online now. So mm -hmm. I'm really old. I've dated myself and I've pivoted so many times and I'm probably not done pivoting. There'll, there will be more things because it's not just about that one thing. And you do have to see where is the greatest opportunity for me to make impact. Because I know if I'm doing something that I love doing, money's going to come. I don't know how. And I, and I rarely expect it yeah. to happen that way either. It's really uh, trusting the process in my life. A lot of people will tell you, you need to have a 20, 10, 5, and 2-year plan. I don't have a 1-year plan. I, I wake up each day and I look at, okay, what, what am I doing today? What's important? What do I have in the calendar? And what do I want to do? What's interesting to me? What toys do I want to play with? You know, metaphorically speaking, sometimes literally speaking. Yeah. And often when I do that, I learn something. And when I learn something and I share it with other people, they want to know, well, how do you do that? And all of a sudden I've got a business around this thing that I've begun to master that other people will pay me to learn. It's not rocket science. No, but as you, as you said a couple of times, it is trusting the process um, yeah. and, and reverse engineering that to, you know, to come into uh, the fun formula book that, that you've just released. And hopefully for you, it'll be another New York Times bestseller uh, from Joel Kahn. will be fantastic to see that. Um, is there a, uh, a daily... I guess a uh, way that you find that, that purpose, or is it a, uh, a monthly process of meditation or what's your, what's your decompression technique that allows you to free up what you're thinking about? Uh, well, I actually have a lot of free time to, to think. I try to walk every day. I try to get up for an hour and move my body. And that's a great time to get on the phone, catch up with friends, family, associates, or listen to podcasts or listen to music, clear my mind. Right. Uh, I don't have a schedule unless I've got something on my calendar that needs to be done. All of the time in between is free time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the way it's been for a very long time. I, I have uh, really a uh, ridiculous amount of time where there's not something that I have to do. And so I think that that is what opens up opportunity for me to explore you know, other things. And sometimes I don't want to explore something else. I like what I'm doing now. I'm not looking, I'm not making a ton of money, uh, but I'm not looking to, and I'm not looking for opportunities to do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy um, and engaged doing what I'm doing. I love traveling. I love speaking. I love uh, going to events of all different kinds. And when I'm not doing that, I'm home in Denver, enjoying this, my little uh, fortress of solitude here in my apartment. Yeah, nice. And this is very much by design in terms of, as you said, I mean, uh, you've, you've made a lot of money, lost a lot of money. And to find yourself where you are now at a place of happiness, I would say, uh, for those who are listening on the podcast, I'm, I'm interviewing Joel on camera here and the, the radiance of happiness is is coming through at tenfold. Um, I, I've I've never seen somebody so happy uh, to be doing what they're doing, and that seems like it's by design. Yeah. Well, when we say by design, um, I, I didn't see this coming. Right. It's um, design means that there's like a blueprint for it. Uh, because I don't have a blueprint, my my own desires, my own. Um, method of going through life, I guess, would be my blueprint because it's coded into me. I suppose it's who I am. So living authentically uh, by my own natural bent is the blueprint. And that's always worked out, which is why when I see something coming down the road and I wonder, well, this no longer generates revenue and I'm not getting this gig anymore or this influencer, you know, ambassador campaign is coming to and what am I going to do? I don't really stop and think about that much because I know by remaining open and by showing up in the world, that's the trusting the process part, that things always manifest. They just do. And I think that for people, a lot of people are scared of that. They can't trust the process. They have to control the process. But life usually doesn't work like that. When you try to control things, usually you find yourself struggling 
against that thing you're trying to control. It's like this notion of there's an obstacle before me, that door is locked and I really want what's on the other side of that door. So I'm going to beat that thing silly until that door opens. Well, I look at that and I go, that's ludicrous. That is not the only door in your world. There are doors and windows everywhere. There's opportunity everywhere. Why are you going to put all your energy into banging down this one door when you think that's what you want? It might not even be what you want when there's so much opportunity around you. And that is, for me, one of the greatest secrets. It's just recognizing that opportunity is everywhere. And is that a flow that you feel like as in, you know, keeping that metaphor going, standing in front of that locked door and beating yourself silly seems like a ludicrous thing to do. But when you're so close to it, it feels like the only thing to do. Right. Is, that something that, is that something that you genuinely feel? You feel the universe flow and say, hey, this is locked for a reason. Find something else to do. Yes. Yes, very much so. And I've been fortunate to most of my life have that sense about how I proceed. You know, I've got uh, a brother who went to school and became a CPA and, and, uh, I'm sorry know, to hear that. Him to, love him to death. And, uh, but he's still doing it and he, you know, he's can't wait to be done with it. It's yeah. what he chose and, and, uh, he's really good at it, but in hindsight, he probably wouldn't have chosen that. Right. And so, uh, I try not to choose what I'm going to do too far ahead. I just choose who I want to be. And, you know, I've made it to 55. It's, it's worked, you know, my whole adult life, even though there have been seasons of me questioning what I'm doing and wondering, Oh, you know, how do I, how do I get out of this? Um, it always turns around and it, and that's why I'm able to relax now into the process and, and trust it as much as I can. It's not perfect, but it does seem to work. Do you seem to find yourself in the role of a counselor quite often with the people that you meet? Uh, yeah, because I, I would imagine having that uh, ability to, to pivot in a, in a life sense will bring a lot of people to you saying, Joel, what should I do? What's, yeah. uh, what's, the, what's the core piece of advice that you give to someone in that situation who comes to you and says, Joel, I, I, I'm, I don't know what to do with my life and this is where well, I find I myself. I ask questions okay, you know, because I think people, most people know, it's almost like therapy, right? Mm -hmm. You go to a therapist and they ask questions because they're trying to uncover what's really inside you. What do you really want? What do you really think and feel? And so when people come to me, I ask questions, you know, if they say, what do you, what should I do? I say, well, what are your options? And I listen to their options. And then I ask them, well, what do you want to do? And they start telling me what they want to do. And, and like, you have to, you have to let the person kind of come to their own conclusions and asking questions is the best way to do it, uh, which is really liberating because I don't pretend to have all the answers. I don't pretend to have most, most of the answers. I don't know if I have any of the answers, you know, <laughs> my life is a beautiful mess. And I think most of us are and being okay with that. Um, and just asking the questions helps people to discover the answers that are usually inside them already. Some quiet reflection and some, um, some, I guess, understanding of yourself and seeing what you want to do in, in moving forward. I, Joel, normally when I'm interviewing one of our guests, I'm asking about their goals and their plans, but it seems to me that, that you're not a goal setter. Is that, a, is that accurate? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's some, there's some things that I, I want to do, but they're not things that I have to do. Got it. You know, for example, years ago, I launched the Do Good Stuff brand right? And it's, it's a motto, it's a hashtag, it's a t-shirt. And, and I love the brand and people who have bought a shirt for me love it as well. Um, and I would love for it to get picked up and distributed mainstream. But I'm not pursuing that as a business. However, if somebody shows up in my life, that would be an ideal partner for that, then that's something I would investigate. So nice. it's not so much a, um, a goal as another item on the whiteboard that could be something. And I've always got multiple things going on and I'm not necessarily partial to which ones, you know, grow up from their infancy and begin walking and then running and, and becoming an adolescent and then a full grown adult. Um, I'm good with whatever happens. Nice. And so while they're all 
a part of me, it's not essential that any or all of them go anywhere. It's all just what's next. Yeah, to see what to see what explodes. I like it. So, what would you think if we if we had a chat to younger Joel Com earlier uh, in the interview? What would you think older Joel Com? Let's say seventy five year old Joel Com would give you as advice today. That's it. Well, that's really hard to say, right? Because I've never experienced being 75 years old. That's 20 years from now. And I'm sure I will change over that time. Um, so, you know, he'll probably say, get off my lawn. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you this, the older you get, uh, as long as you're on the road to self-actualization, right? Being true to who you are. I'm not saying I'm anywhere near arrived, but as long as you're on that road, um, you care less what other people think. Mm -hmm. uh, you would not believe the things that I have to put up with because of the online world. I mean, there's just outright lies. There's bullying. There's all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and, if I didn't know who I was and if I didn't know the truth, you could really take that stuff to, to heart and it could be harmful. And I just, I've learned to shrug those things off. Um, I see those things as other people's problems and, uh, and not mine. And, and I feel sorry for them. I feel pity for, uh, for those who behave in that way. Mm. And so um, I would imagine that 20 years from now, I'll be further down that road. You know, I think in your 20s, well, when you're a teenager, you should work for NASA because you know everything. Right. And then in your 20s, you think you can do anything. Uh, and this is very generalized. In your 30s, you start realizing, wait, something's up here. In your 40s, you're like, well, all that crap blew up. I messed up so many things. In your 50s, you start going, okay, so if I'm going to do this again, I'm going to have to do this a little differently and you really start getting comfortable in your skin. Again, assuming that along this journey, you're learning and on the path to, you know, self-awareness and self-actualization. So if that's the case in my sixties and my seventies, I'm not going to give a crap at all. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and I like the, uh, the thought of you bunkered down, as you said, in your safe haven in Colorado there and just uh, making sure that everybody else is, is doing their own thing and, and leaving you alone. Yeah. I have two states of being, Walt. I have um, being on the road at events or conferences around the world doing a variety of different things. You know, I could be speaking on social media or entrepreneurship, or I could be representing a brand as an ambassador. I could be performing a bad crypto live show with Travis at a blockchain event. There's just, or I could just be attending event just for giggles, yeah. uh, just to see, cause I'm curious. So, and then I'm networking with people and I'm out and I'm talking and, and right. There's this social aspect. And then the other you know, mode that I'm in is home mode. Yeah. And I'm kind of a loner, you know, it's usually just me or my girlfriend. And sometimes I'll see a friend, but I do my own thing here. And it's really just resting and preparation for the next time that I'm getting on a plane and heading somewhere. And switching that, that, that social mode on where you, where yeah. you need to be uh, Joel Com public and Joel Com private. Yeah. I totally but they're no different. They're not, it's not like I have to go, okay, I'm going to be Joel Com public. Now I'm the same person wherever I am. It's just in those environments. Um, that's, I'm, I'm, that's who I am in those environments because now I'm around people and I'm being social and I'm engaging and, and interacting. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm so an Joel, extrovert. <laughs> I, would you, would you classify yourself as an extrovert? Yeah. Well, I know I am. Uh, uh, I'm an ENFP on the Myers-Briggs, which I discovered is the most introverted of the extroverts. Okay. So, you know, when I go in, um, there, there's people that when they go and they speak and then they have a lot of people around them afterwards, they can do that for hours. I like to do one to many. I get up, I speak, I put out the best content I can. And I'm good shaking hands for 30 to 60 minutes and talking, but then I want to grab a friend and just go disappear and decompress yeah. and not be around too much social activity because it drains me. And uh, I just, you know, so we're all different. You got to figure out what works for you. Yeah. I love that message. Joel, when you are uh, looking at um, these, these people that are coming into your life, who is the uh, influences on you? Do you have people that you look up to? Do you have people that you, that you model? Do you have uh, influences, books, media, that kind of stuff that you plug into regularly? Um, you know, really interesting. I don't really consume business or entrepreneur content. 
I, I don't buy other people's products. I don't listen to show. I listen to podcasts, but they're not in, you know, the business realm, their entertainment or their politics or their culture, whatever, you know, else is interesting to me. So um, I, you know, I'm not the guy who's going to go to a Tony Robbins event and get all rah, rah and walk on coals. I just, you know, it's just, that's just not me. I'm not going to go ever to a Grant Cardone event. I'm sure they're wonderful and people walk away with a lot, but I'm so tired of hype. I'm so tired of, you know, I've seen, cause I've spoken at those events. I spoke for Tony Robbins three times and I see how they stir people into an emotional frenzy and they give them an experience, but very little change actually comes as a result because uh, I think motivational training is BS. I don't think that you can motivate people to do something or to be a certain type of person. Motivation has to come from within. So my goal when I speak is to inspire people. It's to fan that flame that is within them to pursue what they really want to pursue. You know, the only motivations that really motivate are life threatening or, you know, when the tax man is after you or, you know, money can be a motivation for some sex can be a motivation for, for some people, but it really, it has to come from within. If you don't have it in there to begin with, it's not something people can impart to you. Uh, so inspire people to pursue who they really are. And then I think you're going to see much greater results. I love it. I love it. By the way, it is why people will spend thousands of dollars on courses that they never crack open. Because? Because they're not motivated. Got it. They're motivated at the time of purchase, but they're not motivated to follow it through to a, right. to a conclusion that excites them. Yeah. I love it. Joel, thank you so much for your time. I'm, I'm really respectful of, uh, of jumping on and I really have appreciated you on the show. What's next for Joel Com? What Where will we see you? Uh, in and around the traps. I know we've got joelcom.com where people can go and keep in touch with you, but what is your big explosion that you're looking forward to and, and uh, working on? Well, you know, I am firmly ensconced in the cryptocurrency world. I am a futurist and looking out, looking forward to uh, getting more, you know, speaking gigs in that space, doing a lot of traveling. There's a lot of the world I haven't seen. And to me, that's one of the most exciting things about you know, what, what I do is, uh, especially when you're getting paid to go speak, but there's a whole world out there and a lot of people never venture out from their own town. And I think that they're missing the real education yeah. that happens out there in the world when you see how other people live. Joel Colm and the Bad Cryptocurrency uh, podcast coming to you from an airport somewhere in the remote islands. Joel, thank you so much for joining me, man. It is an absolute pleasure to have you, show, you, have you on the show. I love your message about finding your own joy and passion. And of course, uh, looking at the fun formula as your new book. I love uh, the message that you've got there. Again, thank you so much for joining me, man. I, I Thanks, really Walt. Appreciate you. Cheers, bud. <laughs>